Good morning, everyone. On this gray, drizzly morning, you wouldn't be able to see much out of this window anyways, but I assure you it is New York City out here. Um, I'm Mary Brabeck, and I'm the dean of the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. This is our 15th year of holding education policy breakfast, and it's, it's wonderful to see people here, wonderful to, for me, as the dean of the Steinhardt School, to see uh, doctoral students and faculty and alumni. Um, it's, it's great to see members of the Department of Education, members of the press, members of the foundation world, members of the academic community, the rich academic community in New York City. So, so welcome, welcome to you all. Um, this year we're encouraging you to get involved in our discussion as we always hold the last half hour for open um, questions and discussion and um, debate. Um, but we want you to get involved earlier than that. So we um, got a little hash mark you know what those are? So you can tweet while we're, we're um, engaged in this conversation um, of this provocative topic of testing. So the, the uh, tweet number is hash mark NYU and EPBS, what's that? And Policy Breakfast Series, of course, right? Okay, so we would encourage you to do that. We also encourage you, we tape all of these sessions. This is the first of a three-part discussion on the topic of testing. And we tape them all so um, you can go to the website and you can um, review any of, of this conversation. And we would encourage you to do that. Um, I'm not going to tell you a lot about our school, but I am going to ask you to pick up the materials on your way out that shows you the new faculty in the Steinhardt School this year. This is the future of the school described here. And we have what we call our brag sheet. This is the awards and honors for the faculty and the students of the school and our newsletter. And to uh, encourage you to pick up and read these materials, we are also giving you the official NYU Violet Marker <laughs> and Violet Pad, so, which says, of course, NYU Steinhardt on it. So you can have it always by your phone, always thinking NYU Steinhardt. Um, so welcome. And um, this year, as I said, we're, we're examining the topic of testing, and we're going to begin that topic, um, I think, in, a, in an interesting interdisciplinary manner. Um, but I, I want to I share one story with you from my days before New York University when I was at Boston College. Um, you may know that Boston College is the home of the Tim study, um, Trends in International Math Science Skills. And um, in the 90s, some of you may recall, there was a big debate about whether it was constitutionally permissible to have prayer in schools. Well, Boston College is a, is a Jesuit university, and that debate was very, very lively at uh, Boston College. And I remember walking into Peter Rajan's office one day. Peter is a great assessment person. And there was a sign on his wall that said, as long as there are tests, there will always be prayer in schools. <laughs> uh, um, and I think about that often as we, we debate this, this, this thorny question of what do tests do? Um, do they help us achieve the goal of better learning for all kids and better learning outcomes for all kids? And, and today we have a very distinguished panel that's going to be looking at the industry of testing from, from the financial economic perspective. What does it cost? What did it get us? Um, and also from the long view, the historical perspective. And as you know, Steinhardt is a widely interdisciplinary and interprofessional school, so we are, we are really pleased to bring the multiple disciplinary perspectives to this important topic. Um, Sean Corcoran is going to be our moderator uh, for this um, session. And Sean is an associate professor in um, educational economics at NYU Steinhardt. He will moderate our session. And he serves on the editorial boards of Education Finance and Policy and Educational Evaluation and Policy Analysis. Um, he's a former member of the board of directors of the Association for Education Finance and Policy. And in 2005, he was a visiting scholar in residence at the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, Dr. Corcoran is particularly suitable for this 
particular topic because his own research focuses on human capital in the teaching profession and education finance and school choice. Um, he has throughout his, his career uh, examined long run trends in the quality of teachers, the impact of income inequality, and court ordered school finance reform on the level and the equity of education funding in the United States. Um, he is currently conducting several studies on high school choice behavior in middle school students in New York City. So Sean, please welcome to the podium and uh, thank you for moderating this session. Thanks Mary and good morning to all of you and welcome to our uh, education policy breakfast on testing. Um, we're delighted to have two distinguished scholars here with us this morning uh, for a spirited discussion on the history, benefits, and costs of testing. Um, so allow me to set the stage just a little bit. Um, as many of you know, 45 states have signed on to implement the Common Core standards in math and English. These standards will delineate in great detail uh, what students should know and be able to do from kindergarten through 12th grade for career and college readiness. For most public school students, this, these standards will significantly raise the bar for grade level proficiency and high school graduation. And pretty much everyone has found something that they don't like about the Common Core. And of course, tough new standards require new tests. Uh, most states have signed on to one of two consortia, as Matt will tell you in, in his talk, um, that will develop these assessments. Um, this is the next generation of, of assessments and expectations for these tests are quite high. These are tests intended to be worth teaching to, as they say, and involve critical thinking, writing, and complex tasks. The early results from Common Core aligned tests, like those uh, here in New York State, have been, um, needless to say, disappointing. Um, to, to many, has come as a shock, the increase in standards and decrease in scores. It's been a bit of a rude awakening for some parents. And as you know, Arne Duncan got into some hot water earlier this week for saying that those disappointed by the tests were white suburban moms learning that their child wasn't as brilliant as they thought they were. Uh, he later apologized for this remark, but there might be a little bit of, little bit of truth behind that with the, uh, these higher standards. But this is not, of course, the first time that we've sought to use tests to enforce higher standards and improve accountability uh, for our students in schools. Um, as our first speaker, Bill Reese, will show, attempts to use tests for this purpose began as early as the 1840s. And many of the same criticisms that we hear today about student testing were heard in the 19th century. We have standards-based reform taking off the 1980s and, of course, this little-known law called No Child Left Behind in 2002. So I think one of our big framing questions for this morning is, will this time be different? Um, so as, as we begin, I'd like to frame our discussion around three uh, sort of guiding questions. Um, number one, what do we hope, to, hope that testing will accomplish, and how do we know when we've accomplished it? Number two, what are the costs of testing, considering not only the out-of-pocket cost, as Matt will talk about, but also the opportunity costs of testing? And lastly, is there any compelling evidence that past efforts in testing and accountability have worked, and do we think they'll be different in the future? So now let me uh, introduce our first speaker, William Reese. Uh, William Reese is the Carl Kasel Worf Professor of, of Educational Policy Studies and History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a member of the National Academy of, De of Education and a fellow of the, of the American Educational Research Association. His specialization is education policy studies and he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on the history of American and European education and on an array of reform movements in American history. Dr. Reese's books uh, are many. They include the, the Power and Promise of School Reform, Grassroots Movements During the Progressive Era, the Origins of the American High School, America's Public Schools, From the Common School to No Child Left Behind, History, Education, and the Schools, and in a co-edited volume titled Rethinking the History of American Education. Dr. Reese's most recent book is, is, is quite new. It's called Testing Wars in the Public Schools, A Forgotten History. And following our session today, I'd encourage you to um, uh, take a look at his book. It's, it's available for sale outside uh, of these doors through the NYU Bookstore for a 20% discount. Um, and uh, you can pick up a copy as, as, as you go. Right, so let me welcome to the podium, Bill Reese. Why, thank you, and thank you for the honor, uh, the chance to speak with you today. So I'm looking forward to this. In 1800, children's academic achievement was judged impressionistically, mostly through oral examinations. By 1900, however, educators in America's urban school systems often judged pupils on test scores in common written tests. Pupils competed regularly in timed exams, and statistics became central to school evaluation. 
we live with the consequences. Today, tests help determine who proceeds to the next grade, enters selective colleges, or falls into the abyss of the service economy. America's zeal for testing did not begin with No Child Left Behind, nor did it begin with the invention of IQ or achievement tests a century ago. The period from roughly 1840 to 1900 constitutes the forgotten era of testing in American history. Reformers then first tried to measure achievement with numerical precision, a very novel idea. It forever changed how we think about academic standards and educational success and failure. As we test children and test them some more, we unknowingly pay homage to a history still rarely recognized and dimly understood. Wherever children attended school before the 1840s, their academic progress was assessed in similar ways. Children did not attend age-graded schools, but usually sat in one-room buildings, where a single teacher taught pupils of all ages. Few children in the same classroom owned the same textbook, so teachers could not administer common written tests. Oral recitation sufficed. Teachers asked questions, pupils answered orally. Schools also sponsored public exhibitions where prominent community leaders asked a few pupils a few questions to learn how well a school was doing. Pupils often received questions in advance and examiners only called on the most talented students. With common questions, without common questions or a record of written answers, no one could measure academic progress or compare anyone's academic performance precisely. Remembering a, a public exhibition from the 1830s, one former pupil recalled how these stage performances led to ludicrous scenes. Quote, a very few pages of the book we were to be examined in were regularly drilled into us day after day, so that no one could doubt for an instant the exact passage asked at the exam. I very well remember one boy, having been drilled pretty thoroughly in the declining of duo, was inadvertently called on to decline tress before the assembled wisdom. He faltered, looked toward the master at first, completely dumbfounded, then in utter despair faltered out, that's not my word, sir. Such time-tested traditions of judging schools lingered in America's multi-age rural schools throughout the century. The most popular pet play of the 1890s was A Midnight Bell, which enjoyed a long run right here in New York. Audiences reportedly laughed heartily at one scene in particular, which reenacted a school exhibition, complete with inane questions and answers. Asked to locate the North Pole, a bewildered student replies, if explorers could not find it, why ask me? <laughs> one playbill shows a pupil flubbing the question. He points to the sky. His forlorn teacher stares straight ahead. The 19th century revolution in assessment came to rural America once children there attended larger, better age-graded schools. But the story of testing originated not in the countryside, but in cities before the Civil War. The early revolution in testing is impossible to grasp without first stepping back further in time to learn about the rise of statistics and invention of written examinations in Europe. European nations first dramatically promoted statistics. During the 1700s, state bureaucrats sought accurate knowledge about trade, mortality, and population growth. After 1800, central governments expanded the use of statistics, instituting standard weights and measures to foster economic growth. Statistics offered a new way to perceive reality, based on empirical investigation expressed in numerical facts. Statistics undermine traditional rule of thumb methods and guesswork, whether weighing bushels of wheat or measuring achievement. They undergirded a revolution in evaluation and assessment. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, specialized organizations formed throughout Europe to promote statistics. In America, Boston led the way, creating the first statistical society in 1839. Newspapers and magazines also popularized numerical facts, whether sales figures or school enrollments, often expressed in ranked lists. The public appetite for quantitative knowledge grew as numeracy increased, enabling more people to measure, count, compare, and identify trends. That was precisely what written exams aimed to do, for they were a creature of their times. Another innovation besides statistics sparked the coming educational revolution. 
written examinations. Schools had long emphasized reading. Writing was less important for most people. As commerce and literacy expanded in the, in the 1700s, however, more people recognized its utility. In the early 1800s, children wrote on slates. After mid-century, urban school children especially had more access to pencils and paper. As writing instruction became more common, along with better, not perfect, but better age grouped classes, children faced more written examinations, which generated more statistics in the form of scores. Written tests and statistics became inseparable. Americans turned to Europe, especially to England, to learn about written tests, viewed as more objective than oral exams. England was an incubator of new ideas. By the early 1800s, both Cambridge and Oxford universities used written tests to identify honors graduates, a trend well publicized in America. Written tests later helped screen civil servants for imperial service, and test scores influenced national grants to local schools through a system called payment by results. In the 1820s and 1830s, some Americans complained that schools did a pretty poor job of assessing student achievement. They criticized the limitations of oral examinations and called public exhibitions a sham. Written exams seemed like a godsend. And, and complaints about schools reached new heights in Boston, Massachusetts in the 1840s. It provided the setting for America's first big test, a written exam that generated shocking results. Bostonians like to call their city the Athens of America. It had well-established public schools, including the nation's first high school founded in 1821, whose applicants had to pass a short written test. This anticipated greater things to come. Two key individuals enter our story. There's English High. One was Horace Mann, who was appointed Secretary of the Massachusetts State Board of Education in 1837, and soon known as America's leading champion of public schools. The other was his close friend, Samuel Gridley Howe, an educator of the blind. Both men, importantly, were active in the Boston Statistical Society, which becomes the American Statistical Association later, and both men were well informed about the latest European trends in education. In the early 1840s, Mann and Howe even traveled together to England with their respective brides, of all things, on their honeymoon. Knowing how to have a good time, they visited prisons, workhouses, and schools. There they pondered the benefits of written tests and statistics. Through their efforts, Boston soon gave the first major standardized test in America. For decades, Boston had conducted annual examinations of its schools in the usual way. Dignitaries asked a few hand-picked pupils some questions and listened to their answers. But in 1845, in a startling break with tradition, examiners from the school committee judged school quality in a novel manner. They surprised the pupils by giving them a written test. Why did the examiners do so? Knowledge about local politics and the larger historical context is helpful. In 1843, Mann wrote a controversial report on European education calling Prussia's schools superior to America's. He said that Prussian teachers were well-trained and taught without textbooks or the switch. America's schools seemed backward, falling behind foreign competitors. Sound familiar? The masters, that is, head teachers of Boston's grammar schools were furious. They attacked men in a long and temperate report. By what authority did this meddler with little teaching experience pontificate about education? After graduating from college, Mann became a lawyer and a Massachusetts legislator be before becoming secretary of the State Board of Education. He did not take criticism well, and some of the masters were prickly characters. College graduates, too, they were high status, well-paid, experienced teachers. Mann responded angrily in another report, and so did the masters. Their disagreements be had become personal as well as professional. In 1844, Mann's friend, Samuel Gridley Howe, was elected to Boston's Grammar School Committee, the school board, to continue the fight against the masters. Their friend and political ally, Mayor Josiah Quincy, 
appointed the members of the school examination committees, which would evaluate the city's 19 grammar schools. So at this point, the plot thickens. Learning of Howe's appointment, the masters immediately protested to the mayor, saying Howe would never judge their schools fairly. In recent years, the committee only examined the highest classes, supposedly the highest achieving pupils. So these are the kids right below high school. And those classes were taught exclusively by the masters. That was one of their perks in their job. And the master's reputation might ride on the test results. Examiners typically wrote perfunctory reports that praised the masters for running orderly and sound schools. The reports were filed and forgotten. That did not happen in the summer of 1845. Surprising the masters and the pupils alike, the examiners arrived at the schools with tests in a new format. Here's this committee. Surprising the masters and, and the pupils, they galloped from school to school with printed questions and blank answer sheets. They gave one hour written tests for several days in a row on different subjects. They examined 530 pupils, the most that had ever taken a common written test anywhere. Tempers flared during the exam. Some masters verbally attacked the examiners in front of the pupils. How caught one master cheating, providing pupils with answers. As the committee made its rounds, some questions invariably leaked out. Very quickly, some Bostonians sided with the masters, agreeing that the examiners had exploited the children, using the test to embarrass the teachers. The masters insisted that man conspired with how. The masters could not prove this, but they were absolutely correct. What's been great is that I was able to find all the correspondence between all the conspirators. Mann and Howe had indeed conspired. Both men hoped that poor test results would end the careers of several masters. Remember, Mann was a state official, not a member of the school committee. Before the test was written, however, he contacted friends about whether they would like a job as a grammar school master. Mann also wrote questions for Howe for the upcoming exam. When public criticisms later mounted against the duo, Mann and Howe pleaded innocence. The exams, they said, had nothing to do with Mann's very public battles with the masters. They simply wanted to know how well written examinations documented in black and white what pupils learned or failed to learn at school. The average grade on the test, 30%. Mann told Howe to pin the blame on the masters. Otherwise, parents, protective of their children's and school's reputation, would blame someone else, most likely the examiners, the bearers of bad news. Mann and Howe insisted that rote teaching and the ample use of corporal punishment, which was pretty widespread in the schools at the time, accounted for the horrible scores. Only when the masters adopted more child-friendly methods, they said, would scores rise. The low scores shattered the common belief that Boston schools were the best in the nation. For the first time ever, test scores were debated on the front page of local newspapers. By the late summer of 1845, Boston's newspapers reprinted some of the silliest answers by students on the exam and were overwhelmed with letters to the editor. The school committee held several acrimonious meetings debating the motives of the examiners and the meaning of the test. But what had the exams revealed? Who was responsible for the awful scores? The report by Howe's examining committee became a landmark in the history of education. Howe acknowledged that the examiners had been inspired by Europe. Printed in the fall of 1845, the report contained 50 pages of prose and four dozen tables with rank lists of how schools did on each question. The segregated grammar school attended by African Americans, the Smith School, had the lowest scores, which did not surprise Howe, an abolitionist. To provide additional comparison, a girls' school in a nearby well-to-do suburb also took the test. It did best on the exam. The report then was both historically important, innovative, and controversial. It claimed for the first time that suburban schools were superior to urban ones and had documented pronounced racial inequalities. Examining 530 pupils in a common written test today is hardly newsworthy, but it was then pioneering. If the pupils had completed every question, it would have yielded 57,873 answers. These guys are into counting. 
but pupils only provided 31,159 answers, which the examiners still had to grade. This consumed weeks of tedious, unpaid labor. The examiners identified 2,801 errors in grammar, 3,733 in spelling, and at the top of the list, 35,947 in punctuation. Exam questions came from textbooks and required short answers based on memorization and recall. Only a few questions tried to determine whether pupils understood what they memorized. Textbooks of the, of the day overflowed with questions and answers. The 400-page history text, for example, included 64 que pages of questions. The test questions ranged from easy to very difficult. The first question on the geography test, for example, was the easiest. Name the principal lakes in North America. 84% of the pupils answered correctly. 65% knew the main rivers of North America. Some students must have sweated profusely, however, when asked which, quote, rivers, gulfs, oceans, seas, and straits a vessel must pass through in going from Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania to Vienna in Austria. Only 7% knew the answer. The examiners criticized the masters for teaching geography as little more than a catalog of names. The results on the history exam are even more discouraging. Pupils averaged 34% in geography, but only 26% in my subject, history. 82% could answer the first question, what is history? Only 20%, however, could define chronology. History textbooks included countless names, dates, battles, and facts, some very trivial. The examiners asked one history question that tried to determine if pupils understood what they studied. 38% of the pupils knew the approximate date of Thomas Jefferson's famous embargo. Asked to define embargo, only 28% could do so. House Committee concluded that the masters, despite their pumped up reputations, were poor teachers. If the highest class was the cream of the crop, topped by them, what might similar tests reveal in the lower classes? The examiner's report called some of the masters by name pedants and tyrants. How call them textbook teachers, which was at the time was a big insult. Anticipating blowback, Howe's committee repeatedly blamed the masters for the low scores. To a great degree, it said, teachers determine how well pupils learned. And the abysmal test scores seemed to indicate that Boston's famous school system was in a tailspin. In the fall, the school committee added fuel to an already combustible situation. It distributed a copy of the report to every family in Boston. The report also reached the national audience after it was serialized in the prestigious Common School Journal, whose editor was none other than, you might guess it, the man behind the scene, Horace Mann. Mann likened written test results to, quote, a transcript a sort of daguerreotype likeness, as it were, of the state and condition of the pupils' minds. Written tests produced authentic, real evidence, those were his words, about academic performance, a way to measure teacher competence and student achievement. Who could doubt their superiority over oral exams? Statistical in analysis was still in its infancy in the 1840s, and the written tests conducted in Boston and other cities afterwards would not meet modern standards of validity and reliability. But Mann and Howe should not be judged by later standards. The examiners tried to make the test procedures standard and fair. Every pupil faced the same questions and had the same amount of time. The examiners tried to prevent cheating, and they double and triple checked the pupils' answers. None of this mattered as 1845 came to a close. The battles over testing continued. Howe had made so many enemies that he was not renominated for office, but the testing continued. A handful of masters were fired, new buildings were constructed with age-graded classrooms, and nearby school districts started giving similar tests. Mann and Howe had demonstrated that written tests were potent weapons to slay or wound one's enemies while judging teachers, children, and schools in novel ways. Horace Mann correctly predicted that once schools adopted them, written examines would, examinations would never disappear. After 1850, written, timed, competitive tests proliferated in urban school districts, undermining the authority of oral examinations and public exhibitions. Urban pupils faced increasing numbers of written exams. 
daily, weekly, monthly, wherever they lived. In 1862, Chicago school superintendent typically announced that nothing surpassed the written test in assessing achievement. High stakes tests, such as high school entrance exams, remained common until the 1890s. In many districts, students in the lower grades often faced written promotion exams. Flunking them could mean repeating a grade. Testing was so extensive by the 1870s that complaints multiplied. Critics said testing mania ruined the health of pupils and teachers, distorted teaching methods, and narrowed the curriculum. In 1878, an exasperated principal in suburban, suburban Chicago said he lived in a veritable age of examinations. He wondered, quote, how did our boys and girls survive the almost continual examinations to which they are subjected? There are oral examinations, written examinations, daily examinations, weekly examinations, monthly examinations, quarterly examinations, yearly examinations, examinations for admission, examinations for promotion, examinations for graduation. I'll stop there. Well, you get the picture. Uh, urban classrooms were clearly changing. Who of us has not been amused by watching pupils take a written test? Asked the pupil in Syracuse in 1888. Youthful faces are screwed into all sorts of hard knots. Hair is made to stand on ed. Heads are held together as if to prevent them from bursting. While taking tests, some pupils ate their pencil tops. Others seemed to write with their noses. Why and how had tests spread so rapidly? Public schools were governed by local school boards. No external agency could impose testing on any school district in America. Mutually reinforcing factors produce this new culture of testing. Consider the broader context. The quickening of communication by the telegraph, of transportation by the railroad, of production by new inventions and machines. Horace Mann and many urban-based northern reformers believed schools were in a rut and had to adapt and improve. After the 1840s, educators learned about innovations at professional meetings and through newspapers, magazines, and books. Urban superintendents read each other's annual reports, increasingly filled with statistical charts and endorsements of written tests. Faced with booming enrollments, administrators wanted to bring some factory-like efficiencies to their school systems. Tests helped determine who belonged at what level of learning. Cities built more age-graded classrooms, which classified pupils better and offered a more uniform sequence curriculum. Writing across the curriculum also occupied more instructional time. When teachers asked the question, children increasingly wrote down their answers to be marked and graded. Testing was thus integrally connected to a number of interrelated changes. City superintendents and their assistants had the laborious task of writing, administering, and marking exams. Tests were written by hand, printed, then given to children, and graded. There were no machine-readable tests. Testing was so extensive in New York City that after the Civil War, the school board scheduled hearings so critics could let off steam. In the early 1870s in San Francisco, Superintendent John Sweat prepared a three-day test Teachers marked 10,000 answer sheets and sweat rechecked their work. In 1875, the superintendent in Portland, Oregon, prepared 31 different sets of examinations. Cheating was a recurrent problem. Fearful of failing and repeating a grade, some pupils responded creatively. They prepared crib sheets, wrote formulas on their shirt cuffs, and telegraphed answers to friends through hand signals. Anyone who's taught knows all about this. Uh, Test preparation could be stressful since most exam questions came from textbooks. Knowledge expanded in every subject, so the size of textbooks ballooned. What should one memorize? Well, a cottage industry of publishing arose in response. City superintendents knew the most about testing, and some marketed their own guides that promised pupils and teachers a competitive edge. In 1872, Superintendent Sweat published, quote, Questions for written examinations, which had 2,200 questions on school subjects, reprinting test items from several cities. Test prep books, quiz books, and question and answer books proliferated and expanded in size. In 1872, one test prep book had 1,000 questions and answers. The 1887 edition had over 4,000 questions. Competitors continually upped the ante. After mid-century, tests were ever in the news, reflecting their influence and the never-ending controversy surrounding them. 
Progressive educators blame them for making dull classrooms even duller. Since teachers' reputations increasingly rested on test scores, they continued to privilege memorization over understanding, reinforcing rote methods. Administrators often criticized teachers who taught to the test, narrowing what was taught within different subjects. Boston superintendent remarked in 1857 that children there studied a book entitled, entitled Spelling and Thinking Combined, but he never saw anyone teaching anything that reflected the combination indicated in the title. In the 1870s and 1880s, citizens routinely complained that too much testing led to a new malady called overstudy, which ruined the health of pupils and teachers. Newspapers published sensational stories of children who became runaways or committed suicide because of terrible test scores or for being held back in grade. Understandably, teachers recoiled at seeing their names in newspapers next to the classes that scored lowest in citywide competitions. The Chicago Tribune and many newspapers would list all the scores and then the, 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 the main teacher's name next to them. As Horace Mann had insisted, tests were always assessments of teachers as well as students. By the 1890s, competitive tests were so ubiquitous that psychologists, for the first time, of course it's a new field, named them as a source of nightmares among young people. But there was a potential cure. Peddlers of patent medicines offered a cheap, sometimes boozy or drug-induced solution for a mere $5 a bottle. Despite a litany of complaints, written competitive examinations were common in urban schools by 1900. Cities remained the model for villages and rural districts, which adopted more testing once they built larger buildings with better graded classrooms. Oral examinations had lost their credibility, and written tests and statistics became more sophisticated and central to school assessment. Over the last century, in conclusion, testing became big business, more powerful than anyone in the 1840s could have ever imagined. Written tests overturned centuries of traditional impressionistic ways of evaluating teaching and learning. Timed written tests of one sort or another became the norm, and raising scores is now a national preoccupation. While successive generations have tried to avoid the controversies that exploded in 1845, politics, schools, and testing seem forever intertwined. We still fear that other nations are passing us by, compare cities with suburbs, and lament persistent achievement gaps. We worry about cheating and the health effects of high stakes competitions on children and teachers. The dramatic events that unfolded in 1845 and afterwards may seem far away, but they help us understand how our present world, a wash in tests, came to be. Thanks much. How far we've come. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I kind of like the idea of, a, of an exhibition in the public square. I'm thinking of doing that next semester with my final exam. So from the 1840s to the, uh, to the very, very present, uh, some news that's changing really by the day, um, the Common Core assessments. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Matt Chingos. He's a fellow in the Brookings Institution's Brown Center on Education Policy. He's written extensively on class size reduction, teacher quality, and college graduation rates. His work includes the book, Crossing the Finish Line, Completing College at America's Public Universities. And he's also been published in academic journals, including Education Finance and Policy, Economics of Education Review, the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management, and the Quarterly Journal of Political Science. He's received support from the Laura and John Arnold, Lumina, Smith Richardson, and Spencer Foundations. Dr. Chingo studies a wide range of education-related topics at both the K-12 and post-secondary levels. His current research is examining digital learning, the quality of post-secondary instruction, the cost of assessment systems, public employee pensions, and the effects of school districts and their leaders. Matt's most recent publication, Standardized Testing and the Common Core Standards, You Get What You Pay For, question mark, is available for download at uh, our Steinhardt website and also at the, at the Brookings Institution. Um, so let me welcome to the stage Matt Chingos. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mary and Sean, for the invitation to come talk with all of you today about the costs of assessments. 
So we're going to be talking about the cost of anything for half an hour. You better uh, probably refill your coffees uh, because it, it, it might be a, a long haul. So I'm going to talk to you about a two-year project on the cost of assessments that I uh, recently finished. Um, the first year was looking at what states currently spend, and then the recent report that Sean mentioned is looking ahead to these new tests being developed uh, to test whether students uh, are meeting the Common Core standards. So we took on this project uh, for a couple of reasons surrounding the big changes uh, to standardized testing uh, that have occurred in recent years and the changes that are now on the horizon. Uh, states have really expanded their assessment systems over the last decade uh, in the wake of the requirements imposed by the No Child Left Behind Act uh, to test every student in grades three to eight and once in high school in math and reading. Um, it's not surprising that these expanded systems have cost more, right? You test more kids, more grades, more subjects, it's going to cost more. Um, and these costs have come under increased scrutiny uh, for a couple of reasons. One, in recent, especially in recent years, budget cuts have put uh, pressure on all public expenditures. Uh, and second, testing itself is controversial. So later I'm going to tell you that the costs of testing really aren't that high in terms of what uh, we spend to, to administer and score the tests. But because testing itself and the ways tests are used is controversial, the costs themselves have become controversial and have become political footballs. And in the coming years, we're going to see some of the, uh, the not some of, but the biggest changes uh, to testing since No Child Left Behind, um, because states are going to need to choose new tests as they implement the Common Core standards. You know, as many of you know, almost all states have adopted Common Core, um, and they're going to have new standards, so they're going to need new tests. Uh, these new tests are projected to cost about twenty to thirty dollars per student for math and English language arts, which may not seem like a lot, but it's more than a, a good number of states are currently spent. So last year's report uh, is based on new data that my colleagues and I at the Brown Center collected um, from the contracts uh, between uh, states and the vendors that develop and administer their tests. Now we focus on these contracts because in most states, um, they make up the lion's share of the state spending uh, on assessment systems. Uh, now there's some other costs of testing that, that I don't look at in this report. Uh, things like assessment staff in states, districts, and schools. Um, in the future, uh, the, most of the Common Core tests are going to be computer-based, um, so you need technology to deliver those computer-based tests. And of course, there's staff time um, at the local and district level to deliver and score those tests. Um, so the idea here was to be as comprehensive as possible and lose a little bit of uh, detail in, in the process. Uh, because once you get down to the local level, obviously there's 50 states, that's sort of a tractable project for me in a couple colleagues to look at in a year. Um, but when you go down to the, you know, the thousands of districts in the, in, in the country, uh, that requires a kind of more uh, comprehensive uh, project than we were able to undertake. And of course, it's, it's hard to measure these, these local costs. Um, you know, schools buy computers and use them in part to deliver tests at the end of the year, but for a bunch of other things during the year, you know, how, how do you account for that? So what I'm going to talk to you about are the costs uh, in the primary assessment contracts. And by primary, I mean focusing on math and English language arts. We were able to obtain these from 44 states uh, and the District of Columbia. And what those contracts reveal is that there's wide variation in how much states spend on their assessment systems as of a year ago. So this is looking at testing probably from about 2008-9 to 2012 or so, roughly over that time period. So you, I'm sure you probably can't see the, the state names on this chart, and that's fine. But it, what it shows you is just how much uh, per pupil expenditures vary. So on the lower spending side, you have states like Oregon, Georgia, and California that spend $13 to $16 per student. And you have higher spending states uh, like Massachusetts, Delaware, and Hawaii that spend $64 to $105 per student. Now, the majority of this work is, is carried out by a relatively small number um, of contractors. If you can see this chart here, you'll see that uh, you know, Pearson has the reputation as kind of the, the big guy in town, and that's, that's warranted. They have about 39% of the market, um, and the rest of it is, is divided among uh, five other uh, contractors in Pearson, and then this other category is only about 10%. So basically, six contractors have about 90% um, percent of the market. Um, because you know, having the expertise and infrastructure to develop these tests uh, requires some kind of scale. So you know, I, I couldn't just go and develop a test with a couple buddies and sell it to a state because it you know, takes more expertise and, and, and more resources to do that. So what do these contracts add up to? 45 states uh, add up to about $669 million per year. Uh, sounds, like, sounds like a big number. Uh, 
turns out to be about $27 per student uh, in grades three to nine. Those are the uh, grades that are, are typically tested, three to eight, and then once in high school. Now, we make some adjustments, because uh, we wanted to also get kind of a rough estimate of what states are spending in total on testing. Um, the 669 million is a, our rough estimate of math, uh, ELA, just the contracted costs. But for some states, we knew that they spend about 90% uh, on the contract and then 10% on state level assessment staff, so we made an adjustment for that. We know there's a test other than these primary ones. In some states where we had some data on that, it was about half, so for that we doubled the number. And then there were six states that didn't provide us uh, with their contracts. So we didn't know what they were spending, so we made an adjustment for that. So you make all those adjustments, it brings you up to $1.7 billion per year. Once again, sounds like a, a big number. But in the context of a public education system that spends over $600 billion per year, it's a drop in the bucket. It's less than one quarter of 1% of per pupil spending. So, you know, as I said earlier, this is politically controversial because testing's controversial, and people say, how can we spend all this money on testing when we don't have enough whatever their favorite policy is? Uh, we don't have enough textbooks or this or that. So, so what would that get you? Well, maybe it would get you half a textbook or something. Um, and I also took a look, well, let's say we, want, let's say we really cared about making classes smaller. What would, what would it get us there if we, we, st we stopped all this testing? It would get us a 0.1 student change in the pupil-teacher ratio. What if we said, no, we need to pay teachers more instead of doing all these tests? It would get us a 1% increase in teacher salary, about 500 bucks. So really, uh, not very much um, at all. So the, the low level of spending, coupled with concerns about the quality of tests, in many states isn't high enough, um, especially if they're going to be used for high stakes purposes like teacher evaluation, suggests that states may be in fact under investing in their assessment. But if we don't think the tests are good and we know they're only spending you know, 30 bucks a kid on them and we have a system that spends over $10,000 a kid and we're using tests for all these high stakes purposes, maybe we ought to be spending more, um, not less. The problem is more funds for testing are unlikely to be forthcoming in the current budget environment, the current political environment. So there's a real need for states to find efficiencies in order to be able to absorb budget cuts without compromising their test quality, or to free up resources that could be reinvested in upgrades to assessment systems. Um, now one way you can do that is collaborating on common assessments. So that the fixed costs of test development are spread over large numbers of students. So let me say a little bit about fixed and variable costs for a minute, because this will be important to some of the results I'm going to show later. So the idea behind fixed costs is that they're the same regardless of the number of students tested. They're the same overall. So there's a cost to design a new test. There's a cost to develop an item. You, know, you, write, you write a test question. You can then go give that to 10000 Let's say it costs you $1,000 to develop a test question by the time you write the question and have all these committees and you know, do all this stuff. And that's actually, I don't think that far off when it costs to develop one test question. You could give that question to 10 million kids or one kid and cost you $1,000 to develop the item. Create a new data system. Um, you could have a committee that gets together and decides what's the cut score for proficiency. Those are the one-time costs. Now, ongoing fixed cost, you're going to have to develop new items in future years. But next year, you spend 1000 bucks to develop an item. You can also spread that over however many people you're giving the test to. Then you have variable costs. Variable costs, they change overall with the number of students, but they're the same on a per student basis. So if you, uh, the big cost there is scoring tests. If you score, if scoring an essay costs $20 to pay someone to score the essay, you can score 10 essays or 10 million essays and each essay is still, still gonna cost you um, 20 bucks. <laughs> so the idea here is that states currently, um, except in in New England, where there's actually a little consortium that's been around uh, for about 10 years. But most states, like uh, New York, they pay a company like Pearson, you know, millions of dollars to develop one of these tests. Now, if states were bigger, they would be spreading those fixed costs over more students, so the per student fixed cost would be lower. Or if they teamed up with other states, they'd have the same effect. So if you look here in the contract cost data, what this shows you is a plot of enrollment in the state for the 45 states where we got data, and the per pupil contract costs. And there's obviously a lot of you know, noise there. I mean, these contracts sometimes include different things. They're structured in different ways. But what you see is that as the state gets larger, they spend less per kid. And I think the reason for that, the main reason for that, is spreading those fixed costs over more students. Um, it may also be the case that larger states just have more bargaining power vis-a-vis uh, -vis the contractors. Right? If you're California, you just have this huge contract. And, there may be more competition among contractors to get that business. So that's, I think, pretty intuitive. This shouldn't be that surprising. But then we're also able to estimate with these, those data, if, what if states formed kind of smallish 
consortia? What if they teamed up? How much would they save? Um, so what this shows you is that as the number of students in the consortium gets larger, uh, the savings get more. And this is for states of different sizes. So for example, if by joining a 1 million student consortium, uh, a state with 100,000 students would save 37% or about $1.4 million per year. A larger state, one that had half a million students and teamed up, say, with another half million student state, would save 25% or about $3.9 million per year. Now, of course, most states have already joined testing consortia that are, were set up with grants from the federal government to develop tests uh, for the Common Core Standards. Uh, those two consortia, as many of you know, are uh, PARC and Smarter Balanced. These results suggest that states should save, on average, by joining a con consortium like that. But I can't predict exactly how much with these data, because the biggest state um, in, in my data is probably something like uh, maybe 3 million students, uh, whereas the Common Core consortia are 11 to 13 million students. So it's kind of way outside the range of the data. So instead, what I'm going to tell you about uh, are some results from the new report, which take an in-depth look at the cost of the Common Core tests based on the cost estimates that have been developed uh, for the consortia. So let's just start off with a, with a couple of highlights. Um, so Park tells us their, their test is going to cost $29.50 per student for summative, meaning end of the year, computer-based tests in math and English language arts. Um, and that includes uh, writing tests every year. And a cost that'll be three to four dollars more per student for a paper, paper and pencil uh, version of the test. Uh, it's also worth mentioning uh, both consortia are also developing formative tests that would be part of an assessment system given throughout the year and that would cost a little bit more. But not that much more because the scoring is done locally and scoring is, is the big cost. A uh, Smarter Balanced is saying their test, which is a computer adaptive test, is going to be $22.50 per student for the same subjects. Um, but the interesting thing is that the Park and Smarter Balanced models that they're pretty different. Park, uh, of which New York is a member, is a very centralized model. The consortium is going to develop the test, um, they're going to administer the test, and they're going to score the test and report back the results. Where Smarter Balanced is a much more decentralized model. They're developing the test, they're developing the questions, but states are going to have to, on their own, uh, make contracts uh, with, with companies to do the scoring and reporting and all that. So Smarter Balance has the advantage of that is states have more flexibility in terms of how they do that. Um, but the problem there is in order to get a lot of those savings, they need to form mini consortia. So that 2250 number assumes that states are going to form mini consortia of about 2 million students each. If a state was not to form a mini consortia and sort of go it alone, the typical state would expect to spend about $10 more per student bringing the smarter balance cost above uh, the park cost. But we're still looking sort of in the kind of $22 to $32 range um, for both tests. And, and as I mentioned before, the biggest driver of these costs is the scoring costs, um, because the fixed costs are already spread over you know, millions and millions of students. Um, so it's that cost of scoring each, uh, particularly the, the constructive response items, you know, things like essays, uh, where you can't feed that through a Scantron machine. At least for now, there's talk about in the future maybe computers being able to do that, but for now, um, they're sticking with, with having humans do that. And, and of course, that's the great advantage of the consortium model, spreading those fixed costs over so many students. Let me give you an example. Park's estimates imply total fixed costs of about $70 million um, per year for the whole consortium. Now, with Park's current size, that translates to about $4 per student. But let's say in, instead the same Park test development effort were undertaken by a single pretty big state like Illinois, which has 1 million students. If Illinois developed the park test on its own, those $70 million in fixed costs would be not $4 per student, but $70 per student. And the total price of that test would not be $29, but $95. So there really are significant savings uh, in terms of what states can get uh, for their money. Um, but recent defections from the consortia, um, maybe many of you may have seen in the news, uh, Florida stopped being the fiscal agent for park a couple months ago. I think it was officially transferred to Maryland just yesterday. Uh, Alabama withdrew, I think Utah's out, Oklahoma's out. Um, there's concerns uh, that these defections are going to undermine the sustainability in the long run of Park and Smarter Balanced. Um, one key factor is uncertainty about the cost of new tests. Those numbers I gave you before are estimates that the consortia put out there, but not, they're not the price. You don't sign a contract and say, if you do this, this is what you're going to pay. So states may like these new tests or like what they've seen so far, but, we're, but they may be worried that if more states leave, the cost goes up, they're going to be left holding the bag at the end uh, with a test that maybe they like but they can't afford. 
And there's also political opposition to the Common Core, and the political opponents of the Common Core may be hoping for exactly that, that there's some kind of snowball effect, that some withdrawals lead to a higher price, higher price leads to more withdrawals, and the whole effort uh, just collapses. So by modeling the fixed versus variable costs using estimates from the two consortia, enable me to estimate what will cost look like, uh, roughly, if the consortia continue to get smaller. So this shows you for PARC what that looks like. So way out on the right on the slide there is the official estimate of 2950 with a current uh, consortium size of about 16 million tested students. Now since those estimates were done in March, the consortia has already gotten smaller. Uh, you know, three states with a total of 1.6 million students have already left. What does that mean for the cost? About 50 cents more per student. Now when Florida left, there was kind of this sky is falling moment. Oh, Florida, they're the fiscal agent, they're huge, they're leaving. What's going to happen? My estimates indicate another increase of 63 cents uh, per student. What if they just ended up as the field test group? So there's a subset of park states that are administering a field test. Let's say we think of those as the core members and everyone else kind of uh, floats away. Um, that's, you know, quite a few uh, fewer students, you know, probably more than 5 million fewer students. Uh, about $2.50 more per student than the original estimate, cost about $32. And you can lose half of the field testing group and still stay under $40. So what this shows here is that unless the, you know, there's just mass defections, uh, the cost is unlikely to go up very much. And the story is very much the same for Smarter Balanced. The official estimate of $22.50 per student, you know, as if the consortia were to get smaller, um, the cost would increase gradually but it wouldn't really spike until they got very small, you know, basically smaller than the size of a single uh, big state. Um, so they can lose half their members, keep the cost below 30, and they can lose more than two-thirds of their members, keep the cost below $40. So there's also this political snowball theory I mentioned earlier. Um, so I also went and from uh, accounts by journalists made a list of states where there's the fiercest debates over Common Core. And I estimated that you could lose all of them. They could all quit Park or Smarter Balanced if they're, if they're still a member without the price increasing by more than 2 or $3. So that political strategy doesn't seem to be one that's going to be effective unless uh, the politics really change and there's just huge defections in places where that now looks not likely at all. It's a Spire system of tests in grades 3 to 8 that will be linked to its college entrance exam that's taken in high school. It's a computer-based test in five subjects. Um, they already signed up Alabama to do it this spring. Alabama got an early adopter price of $11.70 a student, um, and they're expecting to charge $20 eventually for the computer-based test um, and $26 for the pencil and paper version. Some states uh, originally as a transition test to Common Core, and perhaps some of them like New York will, will keep it, um, have worked with contractors uh, that they've worked with in the past to develop Common Core Align tests. Uh, Kentucky has one uh, that was developed by Pearson for which they're paying 30 to $35 a student. Um, New York um, also has a Pearson test, which I'm sure uh, many of you know about. And the best estimate I could come up with there was $34 a student. New York's actually an interesting case because in most states, the scoring is done by the contractor. So you get look at the contract, you get the total cost, which, you know, like I said, averaged about $27 a person. In New York, if you could really squint at that slide with all the states, you might have seen they were bottom on the list. It was the cheapest state, $6 a kid, something like that. In New York, all the tests are scored locally. And the, that cost is borne by local districts. So it's, it's harder to come up with with the cost for New York. So what I did was I looked at the contract with Pearson, which was something like um, 5 or $6 a kid. I talked to folks in the state assessment office. They say, well, we do a bunch of stuff here for the test. Um, our figure is really $13 a person. But that still doesn't include scoring. And that's done locally. Um, I think a lot of the BOCES uh, coordinate that. So they came up with that estimate is there's a, a consortium of charter schools in New York um, that scores tests centrally for charter schools that want to have that done centrally. Um, and they charge something like $20 a kid uh, to do that. So you add that all up, you get to, get to your $34 uh, per student. But it highlights how complicated it is to, to compare these in a meaningful way uh, across states. Now, there's good reasons why cost is important. You certainly want to spend taxpayer dollars wisely. But I think it's critically important that cost not be the only consideration. I think it's especially true given that these assessment costs are a drop in the bucket of per pupil spending. And at the same time, these test results are being used for important decisions, decisions about what teachers to fire, what schools to close, what students to, to retain a grade. And I think more important than test cost um, is test quality. Uh, so let me just talk a, a little bit about some kind of design principles that I think ought to under, undergird high quality tests. And the, the organizing principle here is that tests should support and drive instruction uh, in desirable ways. 
First test should include the kinds of tasks that we want students to learn in school. Um, if we don't want uh, students to do, you know, rote memorization and drill and kill in school, we shouldn't have tests that only do that. A second test should cover the full range of content included in the standards. Um, conversely, they shouldn't include content that's extraneous to the standards if we think the standards are good. Um, they should probe the depths of student thinking and levels of knowledge expected by the relevant standards. There should be um, easy items, there should be challenging items, there should be items that require students to recall facts and items that require them to show that they actually understand um, what they're supposed to learn. And they should actually measure the performance of all students, low achieving students, high achieving students, students in the middle. Third, as assessments that purport to measure college and career readiness are rolled out, we should demand evidence that they're actually predictive of, of college and career readiness. So five years from now, when students have taken these new tests and they've on, gone on to college or career, we ought to collect data and see, did people who do better on these tests, were they more successful in college? Um, if they were deemed proficient on the math test in high school, could they place into college level math? Um, or if they did better on the test, were they more successful in their career than if they did worse? Um, so I think we need to demand that kind of evidence. And finally, it's not just about good tests, it's about good assessment reporting systems. If the idea here is to provide timely and informative feedback to students, teachers, and schools, um, it's not just enough to have this kind of autopsy test at the end of the year with results that are reported months later. And I think while for the cost analysis, I focus it on, on the summative assessments, um, it's also critically important to think of these as parts of systems of assessments um, where there are these formative components that are linked throughout the year. Um, and if that's a high quality system um, that could replace activities that schools are already doing and um, increase the likelihood that these activities are, are successful. So what should take, states take away from this slide? First and foremost, I think they should not be penny wise and pound foolish by accepting a low quality test in order to save a few dollars per student. And second, I think they should maximize the value of taxpayer investment by collaborating with other states to get a lower price for the same quality test or a higher quality test for the same price. Now the leading out there, uh, options out there right now are park and smart or balanced. You know, personally, I'm not an expert on the quality of tests. I'm agnostic about what they should do. But I think there's a clear uh, argument to be made for them joining a, a consortia of one type or another, wh whether it be an existing one or a new one. And finally, what about policymakers? Are there some things policymakers could do uh, in the coming years to support uh, these efforts towards higher quality tests? So first, the Department of Education is currently um, revising um, its review standards uh, for standards and assessment. And I think they should use that review process to make it harder for states to use low quality tests. At the same time, I think it's important that that process be transparent and not look like it's cooked to favor certain individual tests. Right, there's already uh, concerns out there that the federal government has been too involved in Common Core. That's the source of a lot of the political backlash, particularly among the Tea Party. Um, so I think if the government is going to do this, they have to be really careful that this really is about test quality. This is a transparent process that seems reasonable and is not one that just makes Smarter, Balanced, and Park look good. And second, um, if Congress ever gets around to reauthorizing No Child Left Behind, which maybe it'll happen in my lifetime, uh, I think they ought to require states to spend some small portion of their federal education funding on testing. You know, states put up 10% of the per people spending in this country, roughly. And I think if they were to say, you have to spend some nominal amount, call it 30 or $40 per student on testing, it would force states to upgrade their assessments or to leave money on the table. And would only have a trivial effect on other forms of spending, given the size of the budgets we're talking about. So this is a quickly moving territory. States don't yet have enough information about Common Core tests to make an informed selection. But I think two facts are clear. Taxpayers get more bang for their buck when states collaborate, and students cannot afford for policymakers to compromise on test quality. So thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thanks, Matt, for some uh, very common sense analysis and, and policy recommendations. So I'm, I'm going to kind of do my best to facilitate uh, a little bit of question and answers for our, our um, remaining time this morning. It looks like we're, we're running right on schedule. So um, I'm going to begin the, the Q&A by offering a couple of questions myself. And then uh, we have a couple of microphones that are set up for, for those of you in the audience who'd like to um, ask questions of the panelists. And, and uh, we'll get a, a discussion going. Um, 
So I have, I have two questions to start. So the the, the first is is regarding the, the costs of the of the Common Core. So um, in the presentation you just saw that a you know a, a goal of this report, and this was there's very little. One thing that Matt did not um, say is that there's there's very little work that's done on on the cost of testing at all. There's lots and lots of, of talk about how much tests cost, but very little analysis out there about about the cost of testing. It's very difficult to find. Um, so this is a real uh, contribution. Um, but one goal of the report was to put to rest this idea that that the cost of developing and administering new tests is a major obstacle to their to their implementation. I think what what you just saw is that the you know the per student cost is is quite small, and states have a lot to 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 gain by by collaborating together in in, in these consortia. Um, one thing that this analysis uh, leaves out, and that and the the conversation about the cost of of testing leaves out, is is the unseen and more implicit costs of testing. So the reallocation of of time, effort, and energy that goes into preparing students for the test, and so, um, I, you know, one question I'd like to raise first is, what? How do we, how do we think that the the move towards the Common Core will uh, crowd out uh, other subjects? So for now, the the Common Core has wisely uh, stayed away from more controversial topics like science and and history, um, and stuck to math and and English language arts, and if if if. You take a look at, at some of the sample questions of the New York State test. These are very challenging uh, tests that, that were offered this past year. Um, I imagine that, that schools will need to spend considerably more time preparing for these tests than any tests that they've, they've taken in the past, and you know, for better or for worse. Um, so while past research on, on the, the effects of high stakes testing on um, time spent on other subjects is, is sort of a mixed bag, you know, will Will things look different under this new regime when when the tests when the bar is raised so high, and will will things change even more so in in the most disadvantaged schools that will have the hardest time preparing for these new tests? So that's my first question, a little long-winded first question on the implicit costs uh, behind kind of behind the scenes costs of of testing, and then my second question is: there is there sort of a risk of moving too fast? And so few would would deny that there's a sense of urgency in raising our standards and and uh, ensuring that our our students are, are college and career ready. But is it possible that the rapid adoption of, of new tests and curriculum that have not been fully implemented or fully fully tested, um, adopting these for high stakes purposes to hold schools accountable, teachers accountable, could this result in a backlash? Um, so a, a lot of the backlash we've we've heard talked about so far is is sort of the political backlash about costs or about um, content, um, but the high stakes that are being attached to to tests that are have not been fully fully developed yet. Um, could produce a backlash that will ultimately undermine what what it is we're trying to accomplish with with the uh, Common Core, and so I, you know I could I could ask Bill here: Was there any lessons from history here about the about um, sort of overreaching, or, uh, being too ambitious about about testing? Uh, well, it, one of the things I learned uh, spending several years in the late 19th century, as it were, was that um, two things, I guess response to, to your questions. One was that the uh, by the spring semester in most urban school districts in the 1870s and 80s, weeks and weeks were spent drilling kids in probable uh, um, questions and the answers at the, uh, that would appear on, particularly if they were high stakes tests like promotion exams. In fact, um, there was a backlash by the early 1890s and interestingly, uh, some of the high stakes exams disappeared, but the uh, solution to the problem was universally to just give a lot more tests. So the, the, the solution to the problem of testing historically is more tests with the promise of better tests. So if people say, well, what's the moral of the story, Reese? Uh, what do we learn from all those damn years you spent on that book? That's it, mm -hmm. is that at least, the, you know, the. The past won't re repeat itself. Uh, historians are all about the context in which things happen, so I can't make any predictions. But I'm not surprised whenever I read in New York Times or elsewhere, um, people who are in the know about contemporary testing will say, but you know, these tests are going to be an awful lot better. Uh, and there's always more of them. So uh, what strikes me is that I've often wondered um, about whether or not uh, it's not so much the cost, although the cost will be real, but imagine once all of the issues that came to the fore in the, in the uh, 1990s during the Clinton era about history standards, never mind science standards, there's a kind of sense in which the debate seems in the minds of policymakers to be over. I don't think it's over among the public. I mean, I, 
uh, Indiana, where I lived for many years, um, once people start reading what some of the standards are, I don't mean in English and math so much, I mean in everything else, you do wonder um, whether the debate can possibly be over. It may just be beginning. So on the question of are we moving too fast, I think that would depend a lot on a specific place. My guess is that some places have been more proactive about implementation, implementing the new standards than others, and I'm, I'm not, not an expert on that, so I wouldn't really comment on, uh, on where, but I, I think one problem I'd highlight around implementation, so it's not just about the quality of the tests. Um, as I pointed out, that's not likely to cost uh, very much. We ought to be concerned about it, um, but probably less from a cost perspective. But the other real costs of you know, new instructional materials, uh, new curriculum, uh, professional development for teachers around the standards and, and new curricula, and that's where I'm more concerned. So I think the great potential of the new test is creating a more national market for educational materials, for tests, um, but also for things like textbooks. So if in the past we were worried that basically the textbook process was driven by states like uh, California and Texas, and if you were Wyoming, you got the Texas book with a picture of Wyoming on the cover, um, so I think the promise here is that by creating a more national market, you could have more competition um, and smaller players could get into the market and there'd be a bigger return to them doing so. But the concern is that the existing players, you know, go through the Common Core standards, make their 500-page textbook a 600-page textbook, um, and they check all the boxes of the Common Core, but it's really a low-quality product. But there's a stamp on the front of the test or the, uh, or the book or, or the software. Um, that says uh, Common Core aligned. Um, so I, I think that to get uh, to implement the new standards well, there has to be real concern around um, that, that broader set of issues. So I'd invite you to come, if you have a question for the, for the panel, um, we have a couple of microphones set up if you want to um, uh, take advantage. I, I would just I'd ask one other really quick question. A, a concern in New York has been about the cost of field testing. So there are a lot of parents have complained that field testing has been, has been intrusive. You need field testing in order to develop these items and develop good tests. Do we know much about the cost of field testing from, I mean, anything that you've done in, at Brookings? Or um, is this a substantial cost? or? It's a good question. Um, so I don't know specifically about the cost of field testing. One point that I think um, I didn't make in my presentation is that uh, the advantage that the uh, consortia have, that Park and Smart and Balanced have, is that all of the startup costs, something like three or $400 million, have already been paid for by the federal government. Now that funding ends next September 2014 before the tests go operational in whatever states choose to implement them in the first operational year, 2015. So I think most of the cost of implementation of, rather, of uh, field testing uh, will be covered, um, which you know would be unusual. I mean, you wouldn't a state that was developing its own test would have to pay for that. Now, of course, there are also costs at the local level. Those costs in in terms of time. Uh, my understanding is that they're drawing samples of of schools and kids, so it's not like everyone is taking these uh, these field tests. So there's some cost there, but I think it's less than it would be under than any other any other arrangement other than the one we have with the government paying for it. Great. Okay, good. So uh, we'll start over here with our question, and if you wouldn't mind um, just saying who you are and, and maybe where you're, where you're coming from. I'm Dr. Randy Herman, First Vice President, Council of School Supervisors and Administrators here in New York City. Um, I'm presuming, just based on the discussion, that the determination of the cost per student for testing was based on students who did not require testing modifications. Do you or have you planned to take a look at the cost of the implementation of Section 504 accommodations for students who require them? Here in New York City, that is a significant number of students and a big chunk of change. Uh, that's a great question. So um, these contract data are messy. There, there's no way around that. So in, in some cases, the contracts, uh, what I was going for was the main assessment in math and ELA. So if there was a contract for that, um, that's what I got. Um, in some cases, those main contracts included other subjects that were, uh, could not be stripped out. And in some cases, they included alternative assessments um, uh, aimed you know, to be administered for students who require modifications. Um, and in some cases, those were in separate contracts. Um, so I didn't take a specific look at that. There's, there's a little bit of data, but it wasn't a, a focus of the report. So in that sense, it's in there in some places, not in other places. Um, for Common Core, um, my guess is that those estimates are just kind of for the regular test and would not include modifications. And of course, there's also local cost um, of administering tests with modifications. If you need to have one person sit with one kid um, for a three-hour test and you have a lot of kids that need that, 
then there are real costs there, and that wouldn't be reflected in what I talked about. Thank you. My, my name is Peter Goodman. I write a blog called Ahmed and the Apple. Uh, New York State has been collecting data in the next few months. We'll be evaluating colleges and universities based upon the results of student test scores, and which might be of some interest to people in this room. Uh, and the New York Department of Education has requested from the state that they be allowed to directly certify uh, teachers. I know this is about the cost of testing, but you think that one of the costs of testing is to question the whole method by which colleges actually train and certify students. So rather than saying that the testing only will have impact upon students and teachers, won't these results really have a much wider impact and possibly will impact the universities that do the training of teachers? Also a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I think it should, and I, and I hope it will. Uh, if the, you know, if we think the tests are, are good um, and the standards are good and we want uh, teachers to be well equipped to, uh, you know, work in an environment in which testing is prevalent as it has been for over 100 years, um, then I think you know, training them around uh, new standards and new tests uh, is critical. And training them to use the information that the proliferation of student data has created um, I think is also important. So I talked about the importance of you know, good feedback systems that provide timely um, and useful information to students, parents, and teachers. So if we have that, but a teacher doesn't look at it or doesn't know how to interpret the information or isn't interested or doesn't think it's valuable, well, then it's not very useful at all. Um, so I think absolutely there's implications for, for changing the way uh, that teachers are trained. Yeah. And putting aside the, the, the testing side of it, I would think that, that the Common Core will do a lot to help um, unify teacher training around, uh, around a common cur curriculum. Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a steep learning curve for new teachers uh, it's moving to new places um, where, the, where the curriculum is less well known. Um, question over here. Uh, yes, hi. My name is Frank Pinatosi. I'm Director of Clinical Studies at NYU Steinhardt. Uh, my question is a bit for both. Uh, Dr. Reese talked uh, about how we often worry about how we're behind other countries and how in the history of testing we often look to Europe, particularly in the transition from oral to written tests. Um, at the same time, in many European countries, the balance between oral and written testing is quite different from this country. Uh, we often use the term loosely performance-based assessment, which is not highly valued, also because it's not as quantifiable, and I suspect also much more costly because it involves obviously paying a significant number of uh, people. I have an Italian background and there to graduate high school, the country stops for three weeks as teachers travel around the country and form commissions. So on the other hand, we have the common core driven testing, which purports to uh, uh, analyze the critical thinking skills of students, which in real life are much more oral than are written. And so I'm wondering to what extent this debate exists, if at all, within the testing world, or is it simply a cost-effective answer? Uh, I can give a brief historical uh, history-based response. Uh, when I wrote my uh, manuscript that turned into a book, uh, I, I can let the cat out, cat out of the bag. Jonathan Zimmerman, one of my good friends and colleagues who teaches here, as it turns out, was the external uh, reader. And he pointed something out that I was aware of, but actually was a lot more important than I thought when I wrote the first draft. And that is, right at the beginning of the testing movement, if you can call it that, in the 1840s, what, I, what was really curious, and it took me a long time to th think about it and what it meant, was that there was a twinned belief that tests not only would measure how well teachers taught and students learn, but Mann was not only an advocate of statistics, he was a believer, a firm believer in child-centered education. He was a huge fan of Pestalozzi and other European uh, child-centered uh, theorists. And he was absolutely convinced you could have it both ways, the higher, the, the higher order thinking skills plus kind of what we heard earlier in the talk, the range of questions should be not only factual, but probing in terms of analysis and understanding. And I remember th thinking when I was looking through all of the um, source materials 
on the Boston exams, uh, which you know, all the, I had all the questions, I had all of the um, a statistical responses school by school for each question. It was really striking to me that a few questions were thrown in on, on all of the subject areas pretty much, trying to probe that question of understanding. Somehow testing, it's much more difficult, as you said, to, you know, rate or examine essays. Anyone who's ever read blue books knows how difficult this is. It's hard to standardize the scores. But uh, the dream was there right from the beginning that you could have it both ways. And I, don't, I think we haven't had it both ways. We've, we've valued rote memorization, getting the right answer. You know, I did the number, number two pencil way, way, way to college and grad school. Uh, whatever the new forms and technologies, we're still sort of, it seems to me, It'll be difficult, I think, for a test to do that which even Horace Mann hoped would happen, thanks to testing. He thought it would expose bad teaching and show we needed more child-centered, child-friendly pedagogies. Well, it didn't happen. I think part of the effort underlying the, the new Common Core test is to have more performance-based ass assessments. So I you know the PARC model is, I think around February, March, is a performance-based assessment. Um, including writing, and that takes a while to, to score, and then very close to the end of the year is the multiple choice part of the test, which obviously takes much less time to score. So I, I think there is a movement uh, in that direction. One advantage, I think, of uh, the consortia tests is testing writing every year, um, whereas m you know most states test writing just in a couple of grades because it's expensive to test, and they do it with, with one essay, which has, you know, you can't even you know, measure its reliability because it's one essay. Um, so I know, for example, Park is going to have three extended writing exercises, you know, every year. So we think writing's important. We should have writing on the test. Um, now, I think some of the anti-testing folks are still concerned that the new tests uh, still have too many multiple choice questions, and it's, it's still too much in that direction. Um, and uh, so, so my hope is that the, the all the pressure around cost and getting costs uh, down doesn't uh, drive the new tests uh, to be lower quality than, uh, than they could be. And we, we are concerned, too, about making sure that we teach to all of our standards um, that are at, at, at the state and national level. And, and the comment made me think that a lot of these standards actually do involve oral uh, tasks. So participating in a debate with, with others in the class about a, 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 an important policy issue facing your community, that, that sort of thing, that just won't find, that as of right now, are not finding their way onto, onto the tests. Over here. Hi, good morning. I'm Maris Krasnow. I'm a uh, professor of uh, early childhood and early childhood special education here at Steinhardt. And I want to thank both of you very much. And I want to piggyback exactly on what you were just talking about. And first of all, thank you for telling us that the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> and that what, what I am seeing and what colleagues of mine are seeing are very different reactions than the kinds of things that we're hoping for. So all of the child-centered classrooms that I have been in are no longer child-centered classrooms. Children are now having working snacks to make sure they're covering the, the testing standards and that test prep is taking place all the time now in schools. Now bring to that, our role is to create wonderful teachers for our children. And the next thing that I'm finding now is that with our ed TPA coming, one of the things our teachers need more of is more mentoring in the schools with their cooperating teachers. The cooperating teachers at this moment are, you know, in to save yourself. And uh, I've heard of many schools now that don't even want student teachers anymore because it's too much time and too much mentoring and they just don't want to give the student teachers classroom time because it, they can't afford it. So the snowballing all of, of all of this happening at the same time is at this point in time, it could change, I hope it does, uh, not the kind of results that you were looking for now. Great. Thank you. Was there a question? Well, I'm not sure the, I caught the question. The, the question is, is where are we in that, in that particular case? And, and what, what do you, the question really is, is like help. How do we, how do we help this situation at this time? So I guess the, the concern is that, uh, you know, the tests are uh, creating incentives that are leading to 
it's a behavior that we think is undesirable. So I think that's really a, you know, a question about, about the quality of the test. So if you go back, you know, uh, to, to what Bill was talking about, if you knew the, what the five questions on the test would be, you'd just spend the whole year drilling kids on those, those five questions. If instead you're sampling from item banks with thousands of items and you can't guess what the test questions are going to be, well, then at least you um, fix that problem. But if the items are all of a certain kind that encourage one type of instruction at the expense of others, well, then you're going to distort um, instruction in that way. So part of it's a test qual quality issue. And I, I imagine part of it also goes back to the earlier question about, about teacher training, about you know, training folks to, to react to these incentives and in productive ways. You know, I've always been skeptical that the best way to get good test scores is, is to do, you know, drill and kill all year. You know, my parents are longtime public school teachers in New York State, and you know, a story they always told me, they were, my dad and stepmom were both high school science teachers uh, for a long time, so their kids took the chemistry regions. And there's a teacher down the hall who all year just did practice um, regions questions for chemistry. And my parents you know, integrated them throughout the year and did a little test prep at the end, but it was really just this kind of goalpost at the end of the year. And the idea was that the woman down the hall who just you know, did chemistry regions test prep all year, that she was a terrible teacher and her kids didn't even do that well at the end. So you know, I'm, I'm skeptical that that kind of extensive test prep would even be effective. So I think there's really you know, a conversation to be had there around, around training and you know, helping people uh, react to uh, incentives created by testing in, in more productive ways. I think this also speaks to the, 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 just the simple fact that standards and testing have to be part of a, a, a broader vision about, about teaching and, and learning. And so uh, we can't focus on one of these pieces at a time. We have to think about how testing plays into the development of new teachers and, and mentoring and, and so forth. In, in the middle here. Hi. I'm Luis Perigo Moreno from Skyline Features, and for 10 years we ran a nonprofit organization, uh, educational organization that worked with the New York City Department of Education, training black and Latino youth to make documentary shorts. And I found it remarkable when I was seeing the graphs and st statistics that New York State actually sp is, spends the least in comparison to other states in testing when you'll hear from New York City teachers in the public school system that they're drowning in testing and testing mandates. Uh, so my question is more about, over the course of the last 20 years, what was the impetus then, and what is pushing testing now to measure that is different from when it started? And, and my question is coming from 20 years ago, um, I was involved with the Summer Youth Employment Program that has about 38,000 kids going through it, gaining work skills and educational skills and was part of the Summer Youth Employment Contractors Coalition that have multiple programs with thousands of kids going through it. And the Fortune 100 companies came to us and said, your kids graduating from the New York City public high school system are ill-prepared with academic and social skills. So in the mid-90s, this was one of the pushes for testing. So, but there's this big chorus now against testing with people like Maya Angelou, who are basically saying it's a lot about memorization, it's not measuring comprehension uh, from a relevance-based learning perspective and so on. So again, what do you see in your opinion? What was it in the last 20 years and where is it now in regard to what we're really trying to measure with the testing? Great. Do you want to comment on the last couple well, decades? Or? Yeah, I mean, the real impetus, uh, historically speaking, Testing has certainly been around for a long time, but the stakes in terms of doing well or poorly, what it means in terms of social costs, has certainly changed. So that during the Great Society, um, Robert Kennedy, um, sort of you might say on the left from the Democratic side of the spectrum, was, wasn't convinced that federal funds would be used to raise the achievement of poor kids. So uh, along with other people, we ended up with NAEP and other kinds of measures which were not punitive in the way that No Child Left Behind would be, but it was sort of, you know, the so-called nation's report card. By the 1980s, the fear of Japanese dominance, which now seems kind of a joke, but then it was not a joke, <laughs> helped fuel um, a nation at risk. And as American economic policy seemed unable to replace good paying jobs with uh, the jobs that were disappearing in the, in the post-industrial America, schools became in some ways the, the cause of the problem and the cure of the problem. And so 
my short answer is that in, in, in less than a generation, we went from an expectation that, well, for the kids who didn't do well, there'd be jobs for them. This is certainly pre-1970s. Pre my dad had a ninth grade education, worked in a factory, so did my mom. They had a union protections, tiny pay increases every year. They were part of that World War II dream of upward mobility. From the 1980s on, uh, what economic leaders haven't been able to do, they expect schools to do. And schools are seen as both the cause of the problem and the cure. And it's hard to figure out, you know, testing is just, as we've seen, part of this larger kind of conversation about the place of schools in American society. And there is that snowballing effect. It, it isn't just a test. It, it, it runs right through the gamut of how we think about schools at now at all levels of education. Yeah, I'm certainly sympathetic to to many of the concerns that have been raised about testing. I think a lot of them, as I talked about, have to do with, uh, with the quality of the test, but I don't think you'd ever uh, get rid of all of them. Uh, but it's just not clear to me what the alternative would be if you didn't have you know, any testing at all. Um, you could have no idea whether people you know, knew anything. Uh, you'd still have people showing up at college, getting put in, having to take algebra that should have learned in ninth grade, you know, as you know, many, many uh, students are doing today. Um, and, and you'd still have all the problems of, uh, you know, outcomes that are not as good as we would like, even if you didn't have as good measurements uh, of them. So I guess it's never, never been clear to me what the alternative would be. So I think there's really a conversation to be had about the design of the test, the design of the accountability system, you know, how the tests um, are used. But it's hard to me to see the argument for not having the information. Thank you. On my right, here. Hi, yes, my name is Kane Holder. Um, I'm a blogger and an educator. I write a blog called Billion Served because for better and worse, I feel like education is the gold rush of the 21st century. So my question is about the balance between qualitative and quantitative. I'm very concerned. Uh, the Association of American Colleges and Universities president apologized to all university professors stating that this generation of students are the least critical thinking, the least, you know, they're just reductive. They just want a grade. They just want a score. And that is because of no child, that's the generation that grew up under no child left behind. So my question is the notion of being a lifelong learner, the notion of immersive education, student-centered education. Where is the balance? I'm seeing a lot of money and money is not necessarily the problem or the solution, but I'm seeing a lot of money being advocated towards more testing. But the students aren't thinking. And if you look at any Fortune 500 company, they need thinkers. They need people who think outside the box, not bubbles. Teachers don't learn anything about their students from a scantron. You know your student from a poem, from a comic book th that they do. You know the colors that, that, that are their favorites. You know the student from that, not a scantron. So what are we going to do to flip the balance so that we actually become a society where we embrace the love of learning for the sake of being a better human being occupying planet Earth? Responses? Well, well I, was, I guess I was one of the reasons you thought people wanted to spend more on testing, because I want to spend more on testing, so maybe I'll uh, uh, take on the question. So like I said, I'm uh, you know, really sympathetic uh, to these kinds of concerns. Um, you know, I've, I've beat up a little bit on multiple cho choice test questions. I think you actually can have good ones and bad ones, and I think there can be a role for a question uh, that challenges people to think critically and happens to have you know, A through D answers at the end. But I think you're absolutely right that uh, you know, we also need to measure uh, people's uh, skills and abilities in other ways. And I think, you know, you talked about demands of, of the workforce. You know, I think writing is a you know, critically important skill. You know, I was a, a graduate student at, at Harvard, and I did some, some teaching of undergraduates as part of that. And I was amazed at, you know, how poor the writing skills were of many of the Harvard undergraduates, supposedly, you know, the cream of, of, of the crop. So. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly concerned as well um, about uh, you know, people possessing a broad uh, range of skills. But you know, if you want to encourage people to do writing and critical thinking, and uh, you know, I think that ought to be part of part of the whole system. You know, I think 
one place where, uh, where Common Core tries to do this is as, as part of uh, the Common Core standards is for people to be able to synthesize evidence, to look at a bunch of sources and you know, consider different arguments and cite sources and, and bring that all together. And I think that is a company, uh, a skill that, that uh, employers absolutely care about. Not, not that we should be designing the whole system around the needs of employers, but uh, clearly that's one important component. Um, certainly, I'll, I'll speak as an historian and educator. What I've noticed, I started teaching, I guess, as a lecturer in the late 1970s, so I've taught a lot of students over the course of my career. They have now absorbed all of the language and, and uh, slogans and cliches that No Child Left Behind somehow how it all entered into their system. So I remember the first time about five years ago, a student asked me about what rubrics I was going to be using for this or that. And I, so I warned all my colleagues in the history department, no child left behind is coming your way, believe me. <laughs> and now the assessments are coming uh, fast and furious. You want to replace a, uh, a line uh, in the history department? Well, uh, central administration, um, in part make some decisions based on we're going to have to have pre-test, post-test, various assessments on this and that. And so they all tease me now saying I was slightly a, a prophet uh, without honor, I fear. But the truth is one of the things I worry about a lot is not, it, it isn't just the test. It's that I live in a, in a district that you might say is crazy about education, Madison, Wisconsin. We approve bond measures. Teachers get raises. They're still unionized for how long, we don't know. But the interesting thing is that if an affluent place like Madison chooses not to replace art teachers, and that's happening because of, it may not be a lot of money, but everyone is under huge, huge stress. If you talk to teachers, and we have a very good friend who's an art teacher, and where there might have been five art teachers in high school, just down to two. It's worse than that. Art will then be for the classes of the underachievers, and they'll be the electives. It's, it's slipping away. And this has long been a concern. Uh, there were reports going back to the 1960s about the place of the arts, music, and so on so forth. I hope that with our zeal for testing, we, 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 we can remember that we'd like to have a broad humanistic education. It's not, to, it's not to say math and English achievement is unimportant. It's very important. But it is to say we should be mindful when we see how districts respond and we don't have that breadth of learning. I think people, everyone knows about Diane Ravitch's change of heart in terms of testing. Well, she worries about, and so do I, about the place of what will happen to history, what will happen to all of the things that are less easily tested that if you ask most experts in the field, you need essay exams. You need to see things other than bubble scores and multiple choice tests. So I, I don't think it's about testing or not testing. It's about having a broader vision about what we think an educated person can do. So I appreciate your comments. Mm. Yeah, so I'm a quantitative researcher, and so not, not to be part of the problem, but part of the solution, I would, I would also encourage more measurement on these things. I mean, we actually, we have a lot of anecdotes about what we're losing in the wake of, of more standardized testing, but not a lot of, uh, not, not a lot of data. Yep. Over here. Good morning, thank you for this fascinating session. My name is Shino, I'm the president of the Community Education Council District 2 here in Manhattan. And I have two children who are in public school system. One actually graduated from high school this past June. And I'm sorry, I apologize. I have to start with a slight commentary. I couldn't agree with you more and the past speaker. The common core coupled with testing is really killing education in my mind. There are so many things that cannot be quantified. The joy of learning, being inquisitive, being creative, all those things that I want my <clears throat> children's schools to help instill in my children, those activities are not happening enough. It's all about math and ELA aligned with the Common Core. And I'm not sure if critical thinking is going to be really nurtured in the way that we're going about it because we're putting too much emphasis on testing, too many high stakes, aligned to the testing, which really the bottom line I think is the problem. If the testing didn't carry so much weight in terms of teacher evaluation, student promotion, we may not even have to have this discussion this morning. So I have to say we need to pull back a little bit 
and think about what it is we want our schools to do for our children. It's not just about literacy and critical thinking. We want kids to be creative, and I don't mean creative in the arts. Creative in sciences, creative in math, creative in writing, creative in every subject. So my question though, it's a little unrelated, it's been said that the standardized tests are culturally biased. And I have noticed this as well. Oftentimes questions are about farm animals, cows on the pasture or something like that, that the urban kids cannot relate to. And in worst cases, there are racial biases, not racism, but biases that a certain ethnic groups can relate to while other ethnic groups have no personal connections to. Is that something that test makers are addressing or even recognizing as a problem? So that's my question after a long commentary. Thank you. So I'm not an expert on, on test design. My understanding is that uh, testing test questions for, for uh, bias, including cultural bias, is a you know, big part. That's why it costs, I think, something like $1,000 to develop a test question, because you don't use all the test questions, you throw some out. So I think that is an inter integral part of the test development process to, to test for that and, um, and not have it. Uh, does that mean that it's successful 100% of the time? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, so it's potentially a, a legitimate concern. Uh, on your first question about uh, uh, what I would say is that, you know, I think uh, there's a need to have, you know, high quality tests that measure students across the, the performance spectrum uh, around all sorts of things that we care about. But that, yeah, there's a real conversation to be had about how, how we use the results um, and, you know, these concerns about you know, driving out uh, different kinds of thinking. So the first thing I would say is that um, you know, if we want people to think critically about reading and math, they need to be able to read and do math at some basic level. So I think you know, the first priority has to be to make sure people are meeting some minimum, minimum standard. Right? If you can't read, um, you can't write creatively. Right? If you can't do basic math, you can't do anything creative um, with math. So I think, but I do, I do think there's a real discussion to be had about how should we set up you know, uh, accountability systems. Um, should we just, you know, have everyone, you know, rate, rate students and teachers and schools based on the progress of students over the course of the year? Or if there's a school where the kids are all above some minimum, well then we don't have to, we can say we don't worry about them. We don't worry if they're making gains on this test because there's other stuff we're not measuring and we care about that more. But I think at places where the level of performance is so low that people don't even have basic skills, I think that has to be the first priority. When I was growing up, uh, Wilkes-Barre Scranton in Pennsylvania, someone said to me, uh, Bill, um, when the committee is uh, formed to create the perfect world, make sure you get on the committee. Um, <laughs> if, if a national standard, standardized test, we will shudder at the thought it could be a federal test. Well, let's just say somehow there'll be more competition and, and then more um, agreement about a national common curriculum for everyone. One of the questions about textbooks, I think, or whatever the curriculum will comprise of. America, compared to European nations, has long relied a lot more on textbooks than was true uh, overseas. And the interesting thing will be, can we actually have interesting textbooks? Because if you standardize what it is that will be on the test, all the quirkiness and odd things that, that might be uh, something that various authors might bring to, say, the teaching of American history as seen in the factual knowledge presented in the textbook will disappear. And no one has ever accused textbooks of not being boring. And the reason why they're always so boring is that uh, unlike math and uh, perhaps like algebra or, or various procedures um, uh, in, the ma in mathematics, in history it's a human subject. And so to keep it exciting, you're going to have to offend someone probably, or leave someone out, or include too many of this group or that group. Um, and uh, what I'm afraid of is that where is the public control over the, these tests, really? Uh, I think it's a healthy thing that states are arguing and debating about these things, but textbooks by their very nature tend to standardize knowledge and usually leaves um, students falling asleep when you try to use them in a classroom. So it's a there's a lot of issues related to, 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 to this common core about what it will even mean for what um, the subject matter is. I hope it's not as boring as most textbooks have been traditionally. 
Do we have time for one more or no? I'm not sure if my watch is running on time. Let's take one. Do we have a quick question here in the middle? And then we're going to I'll try to make firm. Uh, my name is David Mahler. I'm a master's student at Steinhardt. I also manage curriculum development at Manhattan Prep. Uh, there, there are two components to my question. The first is the cost. Uh, I agree with you that $1.7 billion to design, administer, uh, score the tests is small, but that also seems to be a very small piece of the overall spending related to it. Uh, the costs uh, related to the curriculum design and coordination and changes, potentially even teacher training, uh, seems to be potentially much, much larger. And I'm curious uh, what research you're aware of that addresses that, that aspect of the cost. Uh, and then second, I, th I think you specifically mentioned that we're years away from having the data we need to even determine whether the standards that these tests are based on are even appropriate for what we want them to accomplish. Uh, and so given the potentially very large costs associated with these tests, what's the justification for rolling these tests out nationally before we really have the evidence to support uh, their use? So both, both great questions. Uh, uh, on the first question, I was about the costs of, uh, oh, so basically those are costs of other aspects of Common Core implementation. So I'm thinking about kind of long run costs of, of having these tests not being very large. But yeah, I think you're right, the cost of uh, adopting new curriculum and training people are real. Um, I think the Fordham Institute did a, st a general study of Common Core implementation that came out a year or two ago that you might be interested in. I'm not sure there's much else um, out there on exactly what that's going to be. It's probably going to vary by state and, and how places do it, right? Mm -hmm. States that want to do a really good job and, you know, it may cost them or probably will cost them more than someone who kind of just wants to say, oh, yeah, we're a Common Core state. Um, on your second question, uh, I think the argument people would make for why we need the Common Core standards now is just because by looking at them, they're clearly better than what we had, um, at least in, uh, in many states. I mean, I'm not making this argument, but it's the argument people make. Uh, and why, in order to really know whether the tests and standards are, are, are great, we'd have to, you know, have a, a bunch of different things and we'd have to look 30 years down the road, look at people's happiness in life and, and their income to, to really know whether they ever, ever work. So I think there's really a balance that has to be made between um, you know, taking action sooner than, rather than later if you think it's going to help people, um, but also collecting uh, good evidence. Um, so I think you're right that there's a uh, legitimate concern there, but at the same time, I, I can also understand why um, folks don't want to wait until all the evidence is in, because then it's going to be too late for a lot of folks. So we are committed to getting you out on time. So I, I apologize to those of you that still had questions for not being able to get to those. But uh, let me say thanks again to our, our speakers and to all of you for, for coming. Okay. The next breakfast is in February. February the, oh, actually, I think I have this. February 21st on the benefits of testing and its consequences. Uh, Howard Weiner will be here. He's a very uh, uh, energetic and exciting speaker. Um, George Noel will, will also be here from um, Louisiana State. Um, and our own Sharon Weinberg will be uh, available to moderate. So thanks again for coming. Thank you.